I'd write that down for me, Saito. Write that down. With Fumi Saito and Justin Nipper. Hello, patrons. Welcome back. I'm Justin Nipper, and I'm here with Fumi Saito, and this is Write That Down. And we also have a, a special guest run-in appearance from Kiki the Cat. Fumi-san, hello. <laughs> right. Hello from Tokyo. And, and hello from Kiki to all of you patrons. Out there right, listening. right. Oh, so demanding. <laughs> yeah, I, before we were recording, uh, Kiki was really almost on the mic demanding your attention. But um, <laughs> yeah. so... Right. We'll come back to him later. But uh, so today we're going to talk about Keiji Muto once more. Part three of Keiji. Part three of Keiji Muto. So how far? Yeah, as far as we can get. So, OK, Fumi, can you explain to the listeners why this part is important in his career, too? Because it's very, very important. different. Oh, the every part. part of Keiji Muto's 38 year career is important. But uh, yeah, this part will directly connect to Japanese wrestling's dark age and also millennium into new century and a uh, lot of the lot of the change. See, um, not just wrestling, but uh, in 1999, 2000, 2001, we all felt this end of 20th century and this bright, tech, you know, technology future. All these, you know, future thing on 21st century coming, and at the same time all 20th century kind of thing will come to an end. Mm. Didn't you feel Y2K that? Y2K scare, Y2K terror. That, yeah, that too, or all the mystery mystery of 20th century will be solved. Mm. Or what was good during 20th century will eventually come to an end to start the new century or something. And wrestling had the same feeling. Um, you know, evidently, yeah, that uh, 1999, 9, 2000 is like a more MMA, not invasion, but uh, uh, they were, you know, like Pride or K1 or other things in, in MMA type of, you know, uh, co combat sports was taking over professional wrestling in Japan, sort of. And uh, with this, what I, what I just mentioned, you know, all these mystery will be solved, that uh, all the mystery, mystique, I guess, about professional wrestling that we had, you know, as a kid, you know, it's real, it's fake, it's real, fake, uh, 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 it's like, but you lived with it because you loved wrestling so much that kind of wish it was all real, but at the same time, I'm glad it's entertainment because you have your favorite superstars, but it, all these things almost never mattered because you always watched wrestling and followed wrestling and you loved it, but, uh, this MMA, you know, MMA thing, for instance, Nobuhiko Takada, the superstar of UWF and UWFI, uh, challenging Hickson Gracie of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. He is the biggest kind of like an alien, you know, invader from other sport, combat sports, Jiu Jitsu and MMA better than wrestling. And for non wrestling fans, wrestling has always been fake, like a Santa Claus, you mm. know. I agree, you know, are you with yeah. me? Yeah. Hicks and Gracie uh, and, and bringing the Gracies yeah. to Japan really started to shift this uh, vibe that you were talking about, about the MMA, about uh, Pride and K1. From there, yeah. for like after the Shuto event in 95 with mm -hmm. Hicks and Gracie and uh, Yoji Anjo got into it in uh, California. And the California Dojo mm -hmm. and uh, the, the beat the wrestler, you know, of of all wrestlers, the UWF mm -hmm. guys that are supposed to be your toughest and most legitimate professional wrestlers, right? I mean, UWF was a force where they are trying to make professional wrestling into legitimate contest. And we all believed it, which was okay because it was that movement that, you know, was so huge that, you know, that made Pancras, that uh, Akira Maeda's rings and all these things, you know, was happening and but still, wrestling fans were watching. But there was the yeah. one uh, weekly pro wrestling magazine cover that I think shocked a lot of people with Anjo's face on it. And his face was really messed up. It was purple and red and bloody. 
<laughs> yeah, and yeah. They looked real. And they, they Gracie Jiu Jitsu, the dojo people actually videotaped it, you know? That's what I hear. And I hear there is a, a videotape that Hicks and Gracie. Yeah, 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 it's in Japan too. Yeah. It showed it at the Shuto dojo too after that. And it was not professionally taped, it was like home Camp video. Camcorder, you know? yeah. Yeah, but they need, you know, the Gracie dojo people you know, needed to videotape it as evidence. Because you might get legitimately sued or you might be suing each other, mm. right? Especially so that time. It was more uncertain about what could happen in a fight. So, yeah. And uh, there was like, a, you are not, we're going to have a closed door dojo fight. And no, nope, you know, we agreed that, you know, that it's, it's a fight, but you are not going to sue on, on any injuries or uh, whatnot, right? So they, Video taped it as evidence that the, that the fight took place and this is what happened. And the guy left the dojo and then they videotaped the whole thing as evidence. But anyhow, that yeah, that really you know hurt wrestling business too. But the the interest was though the wrestler you know in in Japan, professional wrestlers are toughest. I mean, entertainer or not, still legitimately tough people doing it. You know, that was the whole concept of it. But uh, one by one, you know. Um, if the Hicks and Gracie against Takada, Hicks and Gracie against Masakatsu Funaki, and in a, a, a other, you know, Tokyo, another Tokyo Dome fight, and uh, rings and K1 Pride things that Pride, you know, they use professional wrestlers, mm. namely people like Yuji Nagata and Kendo Kashin, you know, the legitimate college wrestling champion turned to be professional wrestling superstar. And Nagata even had an IWGP heavyweight title as a superstar, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but those are the guys who were sent by Noki, of all people, uh, sent to those Pride or MMA event. And you, you remember Nagata having fight against people like a Feder or, you know, Krakop with just two-day training. I just, hindsight, it's a craziest, you know, attempt, you know, but... Uh, Nagata was wild that the, he uh, he just took it. All right, you know well, this weekend I'm gonna have a fight, and he just did it, you know. And uh, but, team player, huh? but he was a I IWGP mean, heavyweight champion at the time he took the fight. At the time, oh, that would I mean think about that. That that was so much damage. I, I page to wrestling business, you know. Uh, I can't imagine. I mean, the only time that was also sort of a similar situation was a couple of years ago when Brock Lesnar and Mark Hunt had that. Uh, I think they had a match for the UFC title five yeah. six years ago, but it was a, it was different because the fans had already un, like kind of learned what MMA was. They they're familiar with yeah. Brock Lesnar and Mark Hunt and what could happen, and and they were they're more even in um, skill. They both had experience at, at a professional level. Both, well, and also half the people, half the people don't even look at Brock Lesnar as WWE. Wrestler. Exactly, he had success. He had a yeah, lot of one success. foot on the wrestling and the other foot on MMA. Always. You so, know? but that made him special. But in Nagata's case, he really, I mean, uh, yeah, wrestling su superstar went in there and with not much, you know. I mean, practice or workout or program or it wasn't prepared enough, you know, but he was willing to do so. It, was, it wasn't even his, you know, his idea. You know, Inoki just booked him, you know, like through New Japan and then uh, he didn't, you know, make any noise, you know, okay, I'll do it. Like, <laughs> Team player is a good word to put it, but uh, it was just crazy idea in Millennium, you know. Uh, all, I, I really felt that wrestling business and all the you know, thing, all the good thing we experienced in the 80s and 90s will come to an end or something. Is this end of wrestling business or what? And I was really scared, you know. Yeah, because is this the end of wrestling as we know it? Oh my gosh, you know, and the timing was Millennium and you know, you felt that all the good things in 20th century will, will come to an end once. And then the new century starts or something. It was kind of almost symbolic. And uh, yeah. And uh, that was two, year 2000, back to Keiji Muto. There was a reason that the, he really wanted to leave New Japan. Still under contract with New Japan, though. 
still under contract with New Japan, but he left the entire year 2000. Spent where did he go? He went to WCW, another dying area. He, so he witnessed the dying, you know, like Nitro, the real <laughs> death know? of a company, even more. So. Yeah, the Vince Russo era and powers that be, the you know, all the wrestlers that who. I mean, Sting, the Luger, the Flitz, they were under contract. But they were not even around, you know. They stopped coming to Nitro, you know. Mm. Then the Nitro, Nitro was Booker T and Jeff Jarrett, uh, Sean O'Hara, the, <laughs> you know mm. what I'm saying? Chuck Palumbo, the, uh, like a very much uh, <clears throat> Vince Russo era. And he really witnessed this place is going to die, mm. too, you know. And, uh, but he... Um, he, I think at, at the time, Keiji Muto have done everything he could do with, with New Japan, IWGP title, beating Takada at the Tokyo Dome. It, in, in the, yeah, and uh, that was, everybody had this feeling of end of the 20th century into, you know, millennium into, you know, 21st century. Some, you know, there's going to be a big change, huh? If- and yeah. He didn't really go go over there or, or you know himself. Keiji took his wife and daughter over and had a new place in Atlanta. And uh, I thought he was going to live there or something. Yeah. So how long was he there in total? Was he he came in two thousand or did he come right in end of nineteen ninety nine? I'd say two thousand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he pretty much spent the entire year, and you know. And yeah. by this time, his knees weren't doing that well compared to the years prior. Yeah, but he his knees was pretty bad back in eighty seven. You oh, know, even so, wow. So he yeah yeah. So he always worked around it and created the style where he he can do certain things in certain way. You know, and uh, we saw more of that after the year two thousand when he when he finally was skipping ahead a little bit, but he when he did move to New uh, All Japan, and developed yeah. the next stage of Keiji Muto. He he altered what he did in the ring. Yeah, then that's when he was wearing, uh, remember, the black long tights? Mm-hmm. He had this uh, multiple scar, you know, operation and uh, like a foot long scar, like, you know, tissue and whole thing that he cannot wear that short tights trunks anymore. So, so that's the reason. Oh, I never knew. Yeah, same way Misawa was wearing the long tights, you know, because of the green surgery. long tights. Yeah, like a two foot, you know, two feet long big scar or something. Wow. You know? And uh, yeah, I, I personally asked Mr. Baba too. He's like, why isn't, isn't he wearing short trunks? You know, like, you know, when you're a champion, you want to have, you know, short trunks and the ring boots and, you know, like a, your champion Traditional wrestler should look, look like. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. But uh, he has a scar, you know, it's like, like, you can't show that, you know. I mean, it's okay for some people, but for some people, this foot long, Big surgery scar in both side knees and thighs, and it's just uh, just not good. So it's like a, uh, it's good to cover because you will be taped up too. You know, every time you go there, hmm. yeah. Scar and all white, you know, you know this, you know, athletic taping, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, then you gotta have long tights. Anyhow, yeah, the great mood always had the pants, right? So. A regular great Muto will, will be having this long ties from that point on. Anyhow, that it was a 2000. And we got to remember, Giant Baba died in January of 1999. Okay? Mm. 1999, January. Giant Baba died. And around the same time, three months later, Jumbo Tsurura retired from wrestling mm-hmm. and went to Oregon to be a professor, you know? And uh, and a year later, 2000, Jumbo died, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, one year, Misawa and his group of people, uh, Misawa as a president of All Japan Pro Wrestling, worked a year, but he put together a plan for pro wrestling NOAA, and he was going, you know, Misawa was going to just take a few guys, of his guys, and, and he felt that the New Japan and the Misawa's group was, you know, like a split into two groups. But what happened was every single wrestlers and referees and ring announcer and, and, and the ring crew and whole, everybody but Kawada and Fuji left the company, you know, and then came with Misawa, you know, Misawa. And therefore, 
uh, skeleton, you know, all Japan remain, you know, that we have to remember. And year two, at the, at the, at the end of the year 2000, Muto came back. Um, she was trying to figure out, you know, uh, the first match back was Inoki Bombaye, that was half wrestling and half MMA show at the end of the year, remember? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it wasn't New Japan, it wasn't All Japan, it was Inoki's independent. Right, his own, yeah. I mean, it was Channel 4 money. Yeah, yeah. big, big television um, production. Big, big yeah, TV production. It's those few years, I mean, after that, and all the way to like 2005 or six. Um, at the end of, you know, uh, the New Year's Eve, you always have, you know, it's NHK's big singing festival, mm. Kohaku, right? And then uh, Channel 4, Channel 6, Channel 8, they all had MMA shows. Mm. K1, all night. Pride, everything. K1, one channel had K1, another channel had Pride, and Channel 4, uh, Nippon TV wanted to have another, you know, MMA show. They, so they had hired Anthony Inoki as the executive producer and promoter and created Inoki Bomaye. Mm. So therefore, then that was a show where wrestlers and MMA fighter both worked. That was like show five, six hour, you know, long show. You, know, you have all kinds of matches, and uh, of, yeah, of all things, Muto and Nobuhiko Takada made a tag team, right? Against uh, Don Fry, Sha Don Fry and Ken Shamra. So it was kind of returning back to that um, that idea of you know. Are we doing pro wrestling? Are we doing sh shoot fighting, mixed martial arts? Oh, then Don Fry and Ken Shamrock is a perfect candidate to sort of you know, to be deceiving. Exactly. <laughs> you know yeah. To be the best. <laughs> you know what I'm Especially then. Yeah. And it threw Takara. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cause, and Nobuhiko Takara. Yeah. Keiji Muto, obviously, just wrestling superstar. But if he wanted to be, he probably could have been big MMA fighter too. You sure. Know? But, uh, Keiji Muto's, you know, philosophy was like, what's the point, right? Yeah, I, I could see him and also later Satoshi Kojima, they never, uh, they never used or incorporated any of the combat sports or mixed martial arts style into what they did. They never did. They did it more traditional. Yeah, but the, what he was so good at, at the, in dojo was like the quickest Kimura he can put on anybody. Really? And, and he was a judo, he had a judo background going in. Yeah, too. judo, like a third in national. Yeah. So he was special, just he's kind of a, a star from way before. And also, yeah, before New Japan Wrestling, he got the chiropractor license. He knows people's bone and muscles and tissues and joints. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So there, it seems like there was a lot of for thought. Muto, yeah. Thought, a lot of thought going into yeah. his next move, his next choice. Right. And year 2000 ended. So he came home, right? Mm -hmm. 2001 starts. Mrs. Baba... After, you know, Misawa's group left and they formed a new group, Pro Wrestling Noah, to be the next big major legal professional wrestling fine. But that Mrs. Baba, that's when she pretty much decided that the, she is not going to give up. Mm. You know, if it was all Misawa's, you know, group, Herman, you know, in harmony, and uh, kept the old Japan. And it was Jam Jumbo Tsura before he left. He asked Mrs. Baba to have Misawa to be the next president. You know, Mrs. Baba wanted Momota to be the president. Oh, you know? the uh, grandson of Riki Dozan? Yeah. Uh, no, son of Riki Dozan. Mitsuo Momota was. Yeah, son of Riki Dozan. Uh, his grandson is, is also wrestling now? Chika Chikara. That's okay. So Mitsuo yeah. Momota was. Possibly going to be uh, uh, president or in charge after Baba died. That's that's who. Yeah, the old Japan Pro Wrestling. It, no, it was a Misawa, uh, the Mrs. Baba's choice. Mrs. Baba's choice. She wanted that. Yeah. Jumbo Tsuda wanted Mitsuharu Misawa to be. Part. Misawa. Yeah. So yeah. That was a. But the Misawa individual, the, the Jumbo Tsuda was leaving because he, uh, with his master's degree, and he was gonna take the special professor position in, in Oregon, and he was leaving wrestling completely. That's when Stan Hansen decided to retire. It was a brand new era, mm. you know? And Misawa's people stayed with Old Japan uh, with Mrs. Baba, but only lasted a year, you know? That I, I don't know how to put it without being kind of harsh about it, but uh, <laughs> I want to be nice about it though, okay? But uh, 
let's put it this way. The king died, right? The king. Mm. Baba. The, yeah. But everybody in the kingdom secretly hated the queen. Mm. Therefore, under the queen, that things weren't the same. And the Misawa eventually, even being the president, eventually was going to leave and form his own company, wrestling. And it's just like leaving like a Baba family. You know, and it was gonna be just Misawa and his guys, but it ended up being almost every single wrestler, every single ring announcer, and you know, ring crew and referee and a front office employee, almost everybody, but Kawada and Fuchi. You know, but Mrs. Baba decided to you know keep the company, and and you have Fuchi and you have Kawada, and she hired all kinds freelance wrestler all, from all over the country and ended up signing Tenru too for the first time in 10 mm, years. He returned. Tenru came back. Yeah, yeah. Then that was the year Muto still being under contract with New Japan that the, he was sent to All Japan to work all, J- you know, all Japan dates. Like a dream match kind of situation. Like he was on because, loan. Because the group of uh, not Everybody, but the group, you know, people, the executive from New Japan wanted to purchase that version of Old Japan. In 2001? Yeah. So this this version you're talking about is the one with Keiji Muto and... No, no, not yet. Not oh, yet. so right before that. Keiji Muto, Keiji Muto will not be um, president or under contract of Old Japan until... January, January of 2002. Okay, so we have about a year to go. Yeah, during 2001, group of executives from New Japan wanted to purchase all Japan, you know, Mrs. Barber's version of All Japan Pro Wrestling, mm-hmm. much like Vince McMahon purchasing the Dying WCW. Mm-hmm. Does that make Around sense? Around the same time, too, actually. Around the same time. That was, that's why it's so scary. Yeah, crazy. Like a new, brand new era and a new century all the 20th century type good thing will come to an end. I mean, if you were there, you know, you really felt big it, changes you know? felt like they were coming. <clears throat> yeah. The internet yeah. was and a thing now and it was, inf- it was part of what was going on with wrestling. Not, Not yeah, too you, much. You, you had, you, you had internet, you know, and then people had, uh, the, the, my computer was, uh, Windows Millennium or 98, or like you know, XP or yeah, 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 yeah something like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, changed a few times since then, but uh, yeah, internet and the you know, emails, you know, turn into everyday thing, but not as much. Mm-hmm. No moving picture, like you know, today's you know, streaming service movies, yeah, no New Japan like World, that. no YouTube, no, no YouTube, no WWE mm-hmm. Network, nothing, mm-hmm. you know, but uh. So rather the news and information travel a little, you know, slower. Yes. And but the, during 2001, Muto worked still under contracts with New Japan, but worked all the big shows for um, All Japan Pro Wrestling. Mm-hmm. Muto against Tenru, Muto against Kawada, you know, the, at the time, the, the, those were dream matches that worked, mm-hmm. you know. They had to do yeah, those. They, they had. Yeah, they were still running Budokans a few times a year. And uh, yeah, and during the, uh, the the course of 2001, Muto really felt that this might be what he wants to do, you know, that he had this close to 20 year career with New Japan and American careers, you know, great Muta. Now that the, he changed the looks, he shaved his head, it was in Stone Cold, you know, the card angle, you know, yeah. Uh, great, Mut, you know, Mut, Keiji Muto all had the ball, you know, shaved head at the time. It was symbolic too, actually. Mm. He really felt like leaving New Japan for good. Then it was Hiroshi Hase who put together the idea of taking over the company. At the same time, to, just like I said you know, a few minutes ago, yeah. Um, group of people, actually, uh, to be uh, exact, like um, his name was Narash- Nagashima uh, from New Japan. He, they were executive. They wanted to purchase 
that uh, skeleton version of uh, all J- Mrs. Baba, Motoko Baba's All Japan, like uh, j- much like your WCW purchase by Vince McMahon, and to be the New Japan brand of All Japan Pro Wrestling, mm. owing to yeah, two different companies under the same um, umbrella. That was the idea. But it wasn't like the, for everybody. It was, he thought, Muto thought it w- would not change anything. That just become under same New Japan umbrella, you know? And uh, no, he wanted to make this old Japan real separate from New Japan cluster or something and then and Hiroshi Hase and Muto put together plans and really wanted to divide this to a different company and uh, he really completely left New Japan since. And he never, I mean he's returned in guest appearances but he has been on his own path for, since then pretty much, the past 20 years. Yeah, since then, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like this is the same, I mean this is all Japan pro wrestling. See, Coming from New Japan school of wrestling, all Japan is like so far away, so far away, because they never mingled, you know, really. Different philosophy, different channel. It's almost like almost different genre. It's like know? Marvel and Misawa. DC Comics. Two different universes. Oh, but yeah, I guess so. Yeah. For non wrestling fans, they're all the same. But, but for anybody who knows anything at all about wrestling, it's like American League and National League. Or, yeah, yeah, like you just said, you know, Marvel comic and DC comic. Mm. It, it looks similar, but it's a two different thing, and it tasted different. They promote and present differently, and it was, after all, Inoki type of professional wrestling and Baba style professional wrestling. You know, Jumbo Trula type of professional wrestling to uh, Fujinami Choshu style professional wrestling. They were so different. But Muto actually is on his own league huh you know? he's in the kind of mixed stage he he went he went away and learned a lot more from the world and came back and i think added a lot of different elements to what we see in current japanese wrestling. yeah because he made you know not just one trip remember he had 1985 1986 1987 trip to florida mm-hmm. to be the black ninja mm-hmm. he spent a year there then came back to New Japan as a space lone wolf and spent another year or so, you know, almost mid card baby face. But at the time, there was a New Japan group within the New Japan, there was a New Japan Seiki Gun, UWF group, Riki Choshu's group, an American group. You have like a 50, 60 guys in the dressing room, and Sakaguchi decided to send Muto back to America, mm. right? And yeah, then that's the time he went to Puerto Rico and Dallas and signed with Crockett and Crockett became WCW and uh, he was great Muta working Starcade against people like Flair and Sting and Luger and then he became star. So two big trips. Then the, the 2000, he spent another year in America witnessing dying days of, you know, WCW and WCW Nitro, all the political, you know, scene that he witnessed, more so than the actual wrestling. But uh, that's when he decided to be more of a producer type. Yeah, because he had such a unique international view of what wrestling is or what wrestling could be. He was, and, and different eras too. I mean, he was wrestling in the States in a certain time period when wrestling was one way. When wrestling was, what, what it was in 1989 was so much different than what it was in 1999, 2000, night and day. Right, and right. he saw both. He was there for No both. Monday night thing. Yeah, man. no Monday night thing. No, no, not as much TV, uh, different budgets. And at that, in the late 90s, of course, we all know that that's when there was a little wrestling boom in the States. More people yes, were watching. Yes, what, what Muto witnessed during the year 2000 was like, they every week, every Monday, they go to certain cities, 100 wrestlers in the dressing, you know, in the backs, you know, backstage taping the skit mm. <laughs> you know so, <laughs> yeah so he must have had such a different idea or perspective than his co-workers and colleagues in japan at the time because 
I mean, Japan was going through its own, the wrestling industry was going through its own growing pains and growing out in between. And we, we mentioned Noah, we mentioned- And the MMA invasion. MMA, but yeah. there was also Zero One. There were a lot of other, like Choshu did his thing too. So everything was really- splintered. No, that's like a 2002, 2003, yeah, right? We're, we're heading Mutos. towards that era. Yeah. yeah but yeah, things were yeah. falling apart. So New Japan is breaking up to several groups too. Hashimoto's Zero One. Riki Choshu again with Double J in the world of Japan Pro Wrestling. New Japan, as we knew it, it really broke into three or four pieces mm. too. Yeah. And it didn't have the impact it had like it had in the 90s because there was right. no number one star. If people were still looking at Inoki, I think, as the main guy or somebody. And Inoki like that. retired in 98, but uh, remained in public guys forever. Oh, he was on know? all the time. That, yeah, and he, that is very. And that almost killed the business too, because people think Inoki is a bigger star than the, you know the current superstars, right? Always will be, but he's not working in the ring. Mm. And that would hurt the actual business. And it seemed to, and, and like we said at the beginning of the show, we're talking about Yuji Nagata and, and Kendo Kashin. They were his sacrifices from wrestling too. Yeah, because Anthony Inoki decided to side with MMA yeah. world instead of wrestling. He sacrificed world. them to MMA. And because the, that the Inoki's philosophy was, I don't know about other people, you know, but my wrestling was real in my days. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but there was no Fedor in your days either, Mr. Inoki. Or yeah, but Mr. Inoki had actual legitimate fight True. against Muhammad Ali. Possibly the first MMA fight. Yeah, yeah. Now hindsight, people go back to that as a root of MMA, mm. huh? you know? So a lot, that's a lot of research to be made in. You, you can study Inoki Ali fight for There's a whole book you know, that was like written it. on it in English. Yeah, Ashburos. but books, ha books have been written over here in Japan too. Not just one, but quite a few. So it's a big, and, to him, to Inoki, it was a big uh, idea, philosophy. Like if you, if you can't fight like I did, then, you know. Yeah, because that's how he became, you know, equal to Baba. You know, when Inoki and Baba were together, Jan Baba, number one, and Inoki, clearly number two person. And then they went a separate way, that to be able to be the number one guy or even above Jan Baba, Inoki had to do, you know, had to come up with a lot of ideas. See, uh, Jan Baba's old Japan always had every single American superstars, like your Funks, the Jack Briscoe, the Harley Race, the, you know, Nick Bockwinkle, you know, AWA, NWA, everybody. All much. the top Inoki. NWA, AWA superstars. Yeah, top at the yeah, time, yeah. For sure. At the time, and they rotate and you know, all through the year, tour after tour after tour, all the big superstar you read on magazines, they come to Baba's. Whereas Inoki had Tiger Sheet Sing, you mm. know, it was, it, and mm. yeah, no, I, that's why he, Inoki had to go through this MMA like Inoki against Muhammad Ali, Inoki against Chuck Webner, Inoki against this and that, you know, Ruska, Willie, you know, Will, what was his name, Willie. William Ruska. Oh, yeah. No, there was another karate guy, Will, Willie Williamson. Uh, Willie, yeah, Willie Williams. Mm. Yeah. So, Chokshin karate guy. What yeah. did they call? They call so, them other. What? Did, there was a name for those kind of matches, like special matches or other, like a special. Uh, uh, it's like a special. Uh, ish, Ishikaktogi. Ishikaktogi. Yeah, like special transit and mixed martial arts. Mm, okay, yeah, like a mixed combat sports or thing. Yeah. Event. But that became the term MMA decades later, mm. though. That's interesting. Yeah, they uh, they were developing kind of at the same time in in the English speaking circles and in Japan between wrestling and the combat sports. But uh, mm -hmm. and and Muto was so, watching all this as a kid. Yeah, but uh, Muto was the one who who you know when he was rookie, you know, uh, he, he told Akira Maeda UWF at the time, like in eighty six. He was like, nobody's digging your shit. <laughs> 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 it's so honest. You know, it's like nobody's having a good time watching you your shit. It's like no fun. Well, I read something uh, or translated kind of blurb that he said when he was comparing himself to the UWF guys. If you think if they're taking what they took, if the UWF group is taking all the shoot and uh, mixed martial arts elements from Sayama that Satoru Sayama used, kick, yeah. uh, real uh, kickboxing techniques and and quote unquote real techniques where Keiji Muto left all of that out and went to Sayama and took all the flashy stuff 
And I think what he said was I, he didn't want to wrestle in a way that ignored the audience. And he felt that this realistic style, while it's realistic, it, it doesn't entertain. And I think he learned how to entertain. Right. And he felt it's so boring. Because he had that background from the States of how to be an right, entertainer. From judo? judo and how to entertain just uh, how to entertain people watching you with this uh, pro wrestling idea. Not um, not trying to ignore what they're doing and focusing. I mean, that's the that's a flavor of pro wrestling, I suppose, is when it's... Yeah, yeah. And also Muto, in his own mind, that the, he he can entertain because he's very gifted and talented. And, and he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't really, you know, just him, not the whole group of, or whole his generation of people. Muto himself individually can handle anything. I, you know yeah, I, mean? I think his his partner always wasn't always it wasn't just the person or people in the ring, but he so depended on how the crowd reacted to him, and how the crowd reacted to what was going on. He would really base what yeah. he did, especially in all Japan, where he he did less and less stuff. He did less movement, but he had great matches still in just different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he felt that he. Uh, I asked, you know, I had an interview with him around the same time too. That the that the whole motivation was that he didn't f feel that that the, he was needed, you know, in New Japan circle. And while he was working all Japan big shows during the year two thousand, he really felt that these people needed me because they had nothing at the point because everyone had left right yeah so it's like it was a, it feel so much better to be needed and wanted and welcomed mm. and that the, i've got to go to that ring and it's like oh wow there's nothing he could do anything anymore with new japan group you know so he really was leaning towards working all japan all japan and at the same time his old friend politician hiroshi hiroshi hase put together all the details and brought to mrs baba and mrs baba said great great you know it's you know he's coming and it's really really leaving see new japan always try to trick you so she didn't trust the idea first you know but uh, they gave you know had a real uh, this like a closed door meeting that the, is this for real is muto really leaving new japan and really come to all japan then if you know if muto comes in and do this and be a pr president mrs baba is already leave and leave i mean leave wrestling for good because mrs baba was never wrestling people mrs baba was never wrestling fan he was mrs baba that's why she spent 30 years doing it you know but now baba's gone and, and uh, but she didn't want to you know just leave all Japan as it is, but now that the, somebody like Keiji Muto really leaving New Japan and be part of All Japan, and he's taking a company over, that the, she's ready to retire, you know? That's what happened in January of 2002. So, okay, so we're, we're right around the time where he, 2001 is over, Keiji Muto has made the jump, and I, I think yeah. late in 2001, that's when he won the Triple Crown for the first time, too. Right, right, right. But it's still under New Japan banner. Uh, I mean, technically under contract with New Japan, working big show, all Japan's big show. So winning a title, no problem, mm -hmm. you know. But he, that's like, there are only only few people who had both IWGP Championship and Triple Crown Championship at the mm -hmm. time. It was big news. Probably, yeah, Tenru and Vader is it's about it, I think right? so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And also people were excited that the Muto coming in that would create all kinds of dream matches, mm. you know. And upon his arrival, he took Satoshi Kojima and Kendo Kashin from New Japan, and those three would make a lot, a lot of, you know, dream match come true. Mm. And, and yeah. those two that you mentioned, Kojima and Kendo, Kashin, very popular, very popular, and they had a completely different career from this point too. I mean, I yeah, I don't know if it would have been the, time, the same yeah. if they stayed in New Japan. At that time, Satoshi Kojima, after another 10 years later, that he, he will come eventually go back to uh, New Japan, mm -hmm. you know, to be with Tenzan's tag team partner and all that. But the, Kendo Kashin never went back to New Japan, he had his own path, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, 
He's a very unique uh, character too. Unique character, yeah. And then the, that this event really um, changed people's fate. Don't you think? I think, so. I think a lot of people, especially yeah. yeah, on the All Japan, the the let's say the Motoko Baba All Japan version from 2001, 2002, and and yeah. on. So 2002, Keiji Muto, he was he had signed on. He was with uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, in the meantime, Pro Wrestling Noah was basically the old incarnation of All Japan. Oh, Baba's Baba's vision, vision yeah. and yeah. and it was doing really yeah. well. They had their own. Well, what was not what was not calculated at the time was though Channel Four mm. Nippon TV mm -hmm. went with Pro Wrestling Noah instead. So that was the big big um, what is it? Yeah. So the yeah Muto's version of All Japan did not have television. Yeah, they lost a, it. Kind of they, they've been on NTV since. I mean, network television. I'm talking. Yeah, about. yeah. So and All Japan had been on that channel for for decades at that point decades so it, decades yeah it'd yeah. be like new japan yeah, at least 30 years up yeah, uh, yeah before that uh, yeah it'd be like new japan leaving tv asahi it'd be pretty big deal <laughs> yeah not just exposure but the budget they pay you mm -hmm. annually you know so things were really yeah. really different and the shows that they were running in all japan at the time 2002 if you if you can watch if you check out uh, all japan tv or youtube you can see it, it looks different there's smaller venues very dark venues and Keiji Muto yeah. is wrestling guys that you would never think because it's a, a philosophy is different and the way they run company office you know front office different see not just muto himself is i just said muto and kojima and kendo kashin as wrestlers mm -hmm. right but actually, they took five or six New Japan company employees, you know, like your front office staff, like a salesperson and a PR person with him. They all migrated, like five or six guys migrated to all Japan office, mm -hmm. you know. But they, what we didn't know then was though, they didn't, didn't really grow up as all Japan fans. Uh, so they're... They grew up as New Japan fans, so they were watching, you know, old video at at the office, you know, and they were watching old tape of Terry Funk or the Mill Mill Maskers or some, you know, like old tape. They were, they were sitting in the office watching, right? Oh, I didn't know Terry Funk was that that popular. <laughs> wow, Mill Maskers was this popular? It's like they didn't even watch TV growing up. They, the company. <laughs> They grew up watching Inoki in New Japan, right? Mm. So they came in All Japan office, didn't re realize that we they knew so little about All Japan's history. And this the way they ran office, the way the history, Terry Funk, Mill Maskers. I never knew they were that popular. Oh my gosh! And they and an older. All Japan employee, you know, the, the staff was looking at each other and said, wow. So, they must have had yeah, fierce the, loyalty to New Japan during that time. <laughs> New, uh, the, oh, because New Japan fans only watch New Japan and Inoki was the greatest thing. And All Japan fans thought the, that the Baba and All Japan was the real traditional professional wrestling, you know. And uh, yeah, you know, he's always a little bit more original, right? Yeah, he has his own style and, and it's less connected to what's happening in the world. Like I, I always thought, was, <laughs> what I mean by that is what all Japan was always kind of like on the same level. It tried to stay in the, with all the storylines that was NWA was holding at the time. It was kind of like, you know, the, the Japanese arm of the NWA it was kind of officially recognized. So I think. A lot yeah. of people liked that not only was it a part of the big, big game, like in a, like the wrestling Olympics or something you could think of it as, but also all the best Japanese wrestlers were, you know, on par. They were as good as the best American or English wrestlers. Yeah. That's how it was presented. Yeah. And also all these, you know, dream match when I was a kid, you know, superstar against superstar dream match, you know, would be held, you know, you can watch that happens in all Japan ring and you expect double count out or double DQ and, and always like that. So common. Whereas, yeah. Whereas Antonio Inoki would beat everybody. That's right. <laughs> he, he didn't lose for about seven years. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 And also it was like a Japanese baby face against Japanese heels. Right. That's right. And all Japan had more yeah. uh, foreign American versus 
Japanese. Yeah, then jump and jumbo to the Japanese big baby face. And turning Tenru Japanese heel was a big, big new formula. Hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah. Hey. So this is different, all different school. And uh, anyhow, that the Muto's people came in and it started running all Japan's, you know. But uh, what they didn't calculate was that they they knew they were going to lose to TV deal, you know. And uh, yeah. So, so it was part of the dark age too, you know? Yeah, and, and dark age is an appropriate term because if you, do, like I said earlier, if you do watch some of these shows, there was there was no light. They're so dark and dingy and uh, there weren't as many people as we're used to. I mean, only a couple of years ago, All Japan was at the Budokan and and I was watching a few matches uh, over the week preparing for this and he was having matches with, you know, you wouldn't think he was having matches with George Hines, you know, Jackie Fulton, and he's having matches with Bart Gunn and... Guys, yeah. wrestlers that you you wouldn't assume that you might see him wrestle the top talent, yeah, or you <laughs> might see him wrestle these guys in WCW, but yeah, it was yeah. different. So I think a lot of people and myself, American and wrestlers in Japanese market, but they did bring in people like you know Rosie and mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't Jamal. called Umaga, but the, you know, yeah, yeah, and uh, Jama, yeah, right. Uh, Doctor Death, uh, Steve Williams was there, but um. Yeah, right, right. But he was getting sick yeah. then, though. Already. Having short matches. Yeah. yeah. And also, they brought in Goldberg. They went to borrow some money from Mrs. Baba again and to bring in people like Goldberg, you know? But Goldberg wasn't a solution, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, like he's like almost retired, you know, right between WCW and WWE. You know, Goldberg was freelancing and... Uh, he, they spent a ridiculous amount of money to bring him in, you know, like hundred grand a match or something, and you know, but uh, that didn't really help, you know, all that much. Yeah, yeah, because there was also so much more going on than before. It wasn't just all Japan and New Japan. By two thousand two and into two thousand three, we started yeah, getting then, more, uh, then more options. Muto came up with the formula that uh, Muto's All Japan against Hashimoto's Zero One. Mm -hmm. Company against company program. So who was in zero one when they started out at the time with two thousand three? Uh, Hashimoto's Hashimoto. Mm -hmm. So he took a few, uh, few guys too with him from New Japan. Yeah, uh, Shinjiro Otani, mm -hmm. uh, Tats Tatsuhito Takaiwa, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, Takaiwa and Shinjiro Otani, and quite a few in uh, in the independent freelancers, mm -hmm. and also Fujiwara was working, you know, dates at the time, you know. And Takai, you know, somebody like, you know, Takayama will take, you know, pick up a date. Uh, somebody like Minoru Suzuki will work a date or two, you know. And they also had access to Very the Japanese -oriented. NWA title too, the NW, old NWA belt. Oh, right. Now, Naoya Ogawa and the, the, the New Jersey version of NWA, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the same belt. So some people liked it, you know. Some people denied it mm -hmm. in the... Oh, God, it's just, isn't that this millennium mess? It was very, <laughs> and, and for me, I was younger and it was hard to follow because there were there wasn't all that much cover. I mean, there was coverage of it. And it didn't look like it was all for the greater good or something. It know? looked like a lot of uh, popular wrestlers wanted to have their own. They, they didn't want to lose control. Yeah, and then ended up being counterproductive almost, mm -hmm. you know. How many wrestling companies are there, you know? And uh, yeah, and Ricky Joshi leaving New Japan and uh, created Double J World Japan Pro Wrestling just for a year and took Kensuke Sasaki and Hiroshi has to work date there. Uh, Kenzo, you know, mm -hmm. Kenzo uh, Suzuki, Kenzo Suzuki. Yeah. yeah, and uh, from all Japan, they took uh, uh, Omori, you know, Takao Omori, mm -hmm. and they put together a little group, and also the main event was. Ricky Choshu against aged Tenru, you know, and, mm. and the booker Masa Saito. It's like, how many groups did they, 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 the New Japan had split into, you know? It was hard for fans to follow, I think, and they were forced to choose. And at the same time, you are watching K1 and Pride. Yeah, and that was what was the popular stuff. And they are stealing the popularity, you know, because basically, I don't believe there was K1 fans. I don't believe there was MMA or Pride fans. Wrestling fans moved into that, you know? And some of the wrestling fans never came back. 
Yeah, there were so know? many people. Because they found the answer. They found the answer. They always wished wrestling was real for them. It wasn't real for them anymore. Oh, it's always real for me to this day. You know, I love wrestling the best, you know? I mean, I think you feel the same way, you know? We were never MMA fan. But when wrestler worked the MMA show, you had to watch it, you know? Yeah, because there were a lot of people that came <laughs> that didn't ever like wrestling that came and lo- began uh, going to K1 shows and going to Pride shows and talking about it. And it was almost like a, like a trend for a little while. Yeah. Among time. people yeah, that just, yeah. you know, would never even bring up pro wrestling in their life. Like, you know, they, they remember Pride or they remember K1 on TV for some reason. It was that big. It was that culturally. It, it was more like your Las Vegas feeling, right? Yeah. Or like, uh, I don't know, Super Bowl. Michael Buffer type. Yeah. yeah like, or like a big boxing fight. Like, uh, in the yeah, 90s. Yeah, something like, like that. Very, that's why I said very Las Vegas. Las like. Vegas. Yeah. Very Atlantic City kind of just one night yeah. of uh, enjoying And it. in fact, they brought in people like Michael Buffer just to say, that the, what's a let's ready get to ready rumble, to rumble. Yeah, yeah. probably paid him a lot of money too <laughs> you know yeah and uh it's all like a, a very television you know attitude you know and, and yeah. speaking of television attitude this was also around the time i think within this year or the next is when wwe really kind of planted their foot down in in japan through tv oh uh, it was partially because of uh, sky perfect tv mm-hmm. Uh, that the new satellite channel is 200 different channels. The satellite dish, you put it up in your... Did you... When you lived in Japan, did you have that uh, satellite dish up in, in your you know, balcony or... No, your, I balcony? would have to have bought it. I had... Buy it? I had the just the <laughs> kind of TV that was... I mean, just to get for American audience, that all the listeners out yeah. there to understand in Japan... In Japan... Satellite dish, you put it in outside your apartment and... Uh, yeah, to receive your salad channel dish. Thing. It's the only way you can watch a lot of pro wrestling, actually, because like we were saying, like the Inoki show was on NTV and TV Asahi shows New Japan. All of those big channels that we talked about, like Fuji TV, they're on. Yeah. It's kind of like everybody has those channels. If you have a TV, you plug right, into right. The regular TV. channel, network channels. So right. th- that's kind of different from, say, the states where like states have regulations and their federal regulations and you got to. You can't, you can't just yeah, over here too. The zoning law that's why Japan was never big on cable, you know. Yeah, and I think the cable you have to actually have this cable hooked into your building. The way you know Japanese houses are built in a small neighborhood and smaller alleys and, and all the telephone poles and all this cable, actual cable is like impossible in Tokyo. Yeah, and if you live in Tokyo, you can easily just go 15, 20, 30 minutes on the train and go to the venue and check out the show. For- yeah, I guess, place. right, right, right. But uh, this satellite dish with Sky Perfect TVs, 200, 300 different channel came in and people bought it for, for movie channels and you know your MTV or your all kinds of sports channel. And one of them, J Sports had that, all the WWE program already in it with Japanese subtitles, like movies, you know? They had uh, not just Monday Night Raw, you know, Mon- Monday Night Raw, but uh, you had your uh, new, new program, SmackDown. That was new at the time, mm-hmm. right? And they had that, the, what, what's the third show, like Saturday Night Shotgun? Oh, or, uh, uh, around or, that time, it was Velocity or Jacked or Heat. Velocity, yeah. Sunday Night what's Heat. What's the other one? Sunday Night Heat. Yeah. And, uh, yeah Jacked. Uh, Right. What's the other one? The Taka, Michinoku, and Funaki was always on. Oh, Velocity? <laughs> Velocity, yeah. yeah. It wasn't even popular. Then. It was on at Man. 2 in the morning on uh, select channels when I was a kid. Okay, Sneaky. okay. But the, that gained a new audience. What they were watching, they did. They never knew Monday Night Raw was such that the backstage skit, storyline, diva, Vince McMahon's his own you know, involvement was all the dramas, family drama, Stephanie, that the uh, Undertaker being evil, the Stone Cold Rock, that era. That got really new audience, like a TV viewer. And then they brought in your live event to Yokohama Arena. You know? It was almost like a import, an imported uh, live event, like the circus. Yeah, like a rock concert. A rock concert something like they, they brought in a Rocky Horror Show or mm-hmm. something. And it- and yeah. I even see pictures when WWE comes to Japan. You see all the fans in the cosplay. They get 
cosplay stuff of like course their favorite, so many so it has its own so many of them it's so they are they wrestling fans yes but they are wwe fans they created the whole new crowd whole new audience yeah and that on top of all of the new japanese companies in 2003 2004 oh my gosh so, you know yeah it's, if wrestling was popular yeah it's like so much you know so many wrestling groups to choose from and you should be happy but i had this gut feeling that something's gonna you know break yeah <laughs> you know? so i mean yeah. so this this was kind of lasting for a little while he was it's 2004 2003 muto had established his so, old yeah, japan so it, today we're talking about you know keiji muto and his version of old japan they really struggled but they you know they had to do what they had to do you know this is old japan and this is keiji muto running a company and still be still being top star and you're running one you know, the whole year schedule you know you have your spring tour you still have champion carnival you still have to carry your triple crown title you have to have some americans you know what mm -hmm. i'm saying yeah and they eventually uh, within these few years they did get on that satellite channel gaura Gaura, but yeah. it's much smaller. Gaura is not all that. Oh God, it's... they would not pay you the fee, like annual fee. Uh, other network channel will, you know, pay you. It's kind of like if patrons are listening now. It's like MLW on Fubi, Fubo Sports or whatever it's called. I mean, it's it's uh, big, it's okay. you know it's got money. It's big, but it's not NBC. It's not USA. It's not TNT. Like not even close. So it's right, scale is right, so right. much different in all Japan at this time now too. So yeah. we and we have to yeah the, the, we have to remind the li our listeners that there is no moving picture in, in, in internet at the time. Right. It's not. <laughs> it's not like we can yeah. just hop on the internet. I mean, what I would do. I mean, I had uh, the, we had cable internet by this time or in the two thousands. But you, you if you wanted to see it, you have to maybe wait at least a month and a half to get the tape. Yeah. I mean, I would. I would trade tapes with certain people or you could buy TV, but the TV shows would be third or fourth generation. There'd be so, they would so <laughs> by the time they got to yeah, America. Yeah. So, so not just wrestling, but a lot of change, like a drastic change life. in media that the, life yeah, life, yeah. So we went through that at the time. Yeah. And Muto was kind of living out the changes in front of us. He had the shaved head and the goatee and the new style. Yeah, and uh, yeah, he was just every bit just as good, but the time wasn't the greatest, mm -mm. right? So that's why I think yeah. we saw him popping up again and again sometimes in these dream match situations. Like I remember he showed up. In Noah, yeah, at the time, because or... while he was being the president of all, you know, his version of all Japan Pro Wrestling, and uh, you know, president, top star, a booker, yet he was taking dates from people like hustle shows remember oh yeah that's the really dark yeah. that's how dark it got oh that's hustle, oh god that's dark hustle ages. is hustle. the darkest oh of gosh. the dark ages yeah i think so yeah <laughs> oh i just can't i i i mean i how can if we had to I try to erase it from my head <laughs> if, if you had to explain yeah. so some people don't know what it is but hustle was a pro wrestling hustle company kind of ran by pride's uh dream stage entertainment yeah so if right. you had to explain it in one sentence, and they were calling themselves not a professional wrestling, but fighting opera or something, something crazy. Yeah, how could how could yeah. you describe it to somebody if you could only use one sentence to describe it? Uh, wrestling run by non wrestling people, no at all people. They they didn't have any either background or further interest in it. It was just really random, or just they, it's worse, worse, mm. worse because they thought they knew wrestling, how to make you know like a people come and pay for it and they th they thought they had they studied the wwe and they they learned about how to do a storylines and with pride they had money some kind of money to play around they were able to bring in people like goldberg nash hall cactus jack mick foley and steiner brothers on top of your at the time very big Japanese, you know, big in Japan superstar like a Bob Sapp. Or, or even Japanese stars like Hashimoto and now Yoga. Right. Yeah, it's sad enough that the, they were hurting. So they would take, a, they, you know, booking from Hustle. They would probably pay you per match better than your own company. 
something wrong with it, right? With yeah, it was it was hard to and, and even Kawada would show up and he would be doing comedy. Kawada would show up as a dangerous K. Yeah. yeah. Do the dance and yeah. Takara had the M bison. Yes, it's so it's like uh, you know, somebody's selling their soul. It really it just <laughs> felt it felt like it, it. felt like oh, what's God. happening. What happened in this world? Yeah, yeah, and especially with somebody like Takara, who was the top of the serious game, would hit would hit the costume. Yeah. Oh my gosh! And, uh, you had Mark Colvin and Kevin Randleman, who were right. Yeah, people like that, the legitimate MMA fighter, pretending to be wrestler. It was bad. I just all those bad things. Oh uh, God! It was. <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah, you're trying. You it sounds like you still have a PTSD over it. Oh yeah. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> I think many people do. We'll have to sometime revisit some of these shows because I don't even. I think I need some help understanding. That's how I got. That's how I got sick. I think. <laughs> it, hustle. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the around the time and what was happening in the wrestling world, and I thought it was this. Is, this is going to be the end of professional wrestling. Yeah. I mean, two thousand year two thousand seven. My God, oh, you know, yeah. Carl Gotch died. You know, and my friend Mike Awesome died. Bam Bam Bigelow died, and Chris Benoit thing happened. It was a bad time. It just and from two thousand five to that. yeah, and then I went to the doctor, and they told me I have I had cancer. <sighs> dark, dark <laughs> ages. That was the same year. Yeah, so I had to. I had a major operation. I removed the entire stomach, and uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, it was a bad period. But we made it out. We all made it out, Muto and all. I think so. Oh, great, great. Because yeah. Yeah. so okay, so let's talk a little bit about 2005, 2007 ish. So that was it. Was nothing more happened. Wrestling survived. It survived. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't like 2000 oh, wow. where there were. It was like an earthquake. It was everything was shifting. You know, the the yeah. world was Pangea was breaking apart into many and also, yeah, we were all you know, ready to close 20th century, new millennium, mm. and the, the bright 21st century was going to happen, mm. right? But not <laughs> not immediately. Not immediately. So, oh, boy. so but around this time is also when Keiji Muto again pulled out and started his own project again, Wrestle One. Yeah, that Wrestle One was like a another hustle done by k1 no right which is why it's See, wrestle hustle was K1. run mm -hmm. by pride people mm -hmm. right wrestle one was another wrestling show run by k1 people a same idea you know they thought they could take over you know like mma people with money it was popular at the time they thought they can buy professional wrestling you mm -hmm. know and oh god and muto of all people went with k1 and did the you know Bob Sapp or uh, like Abdul the Butcher against Satake or you know <laughs> kind of freak yeah. show uh, booking or, or the Ernest Ernest host doing professional wrestling abdominal stretch yeah, or, or you, you see more of the old not older but uh, K1 or sometimes with Hustle the pride guys who used to be there they lost the matches and maybe their career is winding down and then they go to pro wrestling and do some silly stuff yeah, but the pro wrestling is not bit all something, you know. Mm. I mean, that really harmed the all the wrestling fans' mind, you know. It's, it's like they are really, really treating wrestling as something that below some, yes. you know, MMA or boxing or kickboxing or MMA or any shoot sport. It's it was treated like a joke. It's not, it, and run by people who know nothing at all about wrestling. You know, and uh, yeah, we had to really wait, mm -hmm. you know, to have rest, you know, like somebody with resting heart, resting mind, you know, or who will conquer the, uh, not the conquer, but, uh, you know, these like, good enough resting way, those little things would not matter. You know, you, you really had to wait until, you know, Hiroshi Tanahashi and Shinsuke Nakamura era. Mm -hmm. Sort of. Coming close to, and around this time, I think 2008 was when uh, Keiji Muto actually had an All Japan match with a young Hiroshi Tanahashi when he visited. Yeah, yeah. Tanahashi was kind of the heel, uh, visiting heel. And Tanahashi was sent to All Japan to participate in Champions mm -hmm. Carnival. Yeah. Much younger. Yeah. In, in return, Muto would you know take a couple of dates, uh, New Japan's big shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was yeah. the extent of what we would see from Keiji Muto. You'd have some the big big matches. He would 
Another era. You know, yeah. But yeah. yeah, it's just, again, it's like the, he had great matches with Satoshi Kojima through the time. Who Kojima became his own kind of big star in that mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. But, um, and, and then, so let's talk a little more about Wrestle 1. In the initial days, how was the reception to Muto's kind of project with K1? Well, what's so great about Muto is the, the he could come in and work hustle. He could come in and work Wrestle 1. He can still work all Japan. What he does is just about the same. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. He does not betray anybody. He's always Keiji Muto. You know it's him. Yeah. In any ring, any atmosphere, any environment, or any opponent, Muto will end up looking like Keiji Muto and will always have perfect match. And that saves people's... <laughs> like, that really saved my day. Mm, it relieves us. Okay. He can make it yeah, work. I think so. He's kind of like a Terry Funk, where it, even if the situation yeah, he's is the crazy, only one individual, yeah. you know, that the whole group is not like that. I mean, he cannot let everybody else do the same. But the, when Keiji Muto comes in, we would feel safe, you know, that the, his match will be okay. Sure, you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and it started out. So, all you know, yes, I had. And most wrestling fans, or who, wh- wh- whichever what was it, whoever was left at the time, yes. still had faith in Keiji Muto, and he was our guy. I forgot to mention around this time too, especially in the beginning of All Japan, he also took under his wing Kaz Hayashi, who became a big part of All Japan. At yeah, the yeah, because uh, he, be- those two became friends in, in Nitro, right? Because he was working yeah, I, in uh, WCW yeah, at the time. Kaz Hayashi himself was part of the Michinoku Pro Wrestling, you know. Shiryu. And he, yeah, yeah. And he left and he, to be on his own. Same time, Taka Michinoku left, Mich, you know. Michinoku Pro. Michinoku Pro Wrestling. WWF. And they went to Mexico, went to WWE or WCW. And yeah, they try to have their own, you know, like a, pursue their own destiny and and. Kazu Hayashi and Muto met in WCW and, and then Muto, you know, brought him over. It's like, well, you're part of this group, you know? And, uh, and, they yeah. st- and he stayed uh, part of Wrestle One and the company e- even after. Um, all the way left. to All Japan, too. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the second version of Wrestle uh, W1, yeah, too. The la- I guess the last recently, version. Yeah. Recently. Yeah. Recently. Very recently. Yes. So, well, Things are pretty complicated. It's, it's it's almost hard for us to follow and re- remember. And That's follow. right. So I'm just hoping that the, the listeners out there are following what we are saying. I know? think so. And there, there was a dark age, and I, uh, you know, some somebody said they could hear my. <laughs> it's like. That's how, how how I felt, and when I talk about dark age, you know, it really hurts, right? Yeah, they could they could hear. It. Yeah, well, I think because <laughs> this is also a time, just in general, where uh, wrestling, pro wrestling around the world, it was there, but it wasn't on fire like it had been in the past. Not like now, and not like not not to say it's on fire now, but it's definitely more popular than it was. Yeah, they ago. had to wait. Yeah, they had to wait. Always takes new superstar though. See, um, Bret Hart, Shawn Michael era, good. And Stone Cold, Rock, and Triple H era, good. But you had to wait until John Cena emerged to have another era, you know? There wasn't, there didn't feel like a, yeah, a big shift yet. We still had a lot of old stars, but you know, in WWE, you know, you still had your Undertaker, you still had your, Ric Flair. yeah, sure, sure. And in New sure. Japan, too, at the time, you st- we still saw a lot of old faces showing up, New sure, Japan, all sure. Japan. Uh, Keiji Muto is one that kind of persevered and he didn't really have to, he went with the time, he changed with the style, he didn't kind of get left behind like some wrestlers end up getting left behind because they don't want to change. They just keep what they, they, they're doing, what they do. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work as well. But Muto, right, Muto right. is. And with this version of, you know, this is when Muto introduced, you know, Shining Wizard, you know. That's right. As a new In old Japan. Yeah. Because, so why did he introduce a, a new, less flashy move than, say, Moonsault? Well, it, it hurt his knees every, every time he lands a Moonsault that he shouldn't be doing it. You know? mm-hmm. 
and he could not cannot really you know fly high to do that the high drop kick anymore it was like somebody leaning picture hashimoto on his knees ah. you run into him and give him you know big knee to his face at that height mm. I mean, came up with Shining Wizard. It's more like a motion and running, and it's a whole dance. Not the dance, but you know what I'm saying? Shuffle. When you do the pose ah. and uh, let people know that Shining Wizard coming, and one, two, three, four step or so, like you hit the, hit the move, and that to go home, and you educate the fans as new. This is his new finish. And you beat the guy, so it will be the guy, you know, the move that he's going to beat the guy with, you know? Yeah, and it felt like a more acceptable finish in the MMA time, too. Yeah, yeah. And then also, that tells you how great, what you know, we we're talking about Muto now, but what's so great about Muto, just as soon as he introduced the new finish, Shining Wizard, very next week, rest of the world is copying it. So many, even today. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So many people, like all the independent wrestlers in America, all the independent wrestlers, not all, but the many independent wrestlers in Japan, just as soon as you saw the video, those are the moves they want to try. Yeah. You know? And uh, that's what's so great about Muto. He's the one who created it. Yeah. And you, you know? hear the English announcers saying, they don't change the name or anything. It's the Shining Wizard. Shining Wizard. So yeah, it's, right, right. It, it says a lot about... Uh, just one little uh, creation, and it doesn't seem like it's that uh, big of an impact. But hey, listen, we're still talking about it. People, uh, wrestlers still use it today. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it really it added to the continuum. It added to pro wrestling. It didn't take away anything uh, in a in a hard right. time Only where it's hard to maybe three three or four moves that's in Japanese. You know, Enzigiri mm-hmm. became English yes. word. Um, Saito suplex, maybe right. Fujiwara Ambar, Asai Munsal, and that's about it, though. Yeah, I, I heard Orihar Munsal. I've heard all the, there's a... Oh, okay, Spider German. Spider yeah. yeah, I I've heard lots of different ones. It bit. depends on the company, I suppose. Yeah. But um yeah. but what's popular is you know always Fujiwara Ambar, the Enzigiri, and Muto's move. Mm, because I think because like you said, he really taught the fans, taught the audience. To know what it is, and because we when you think about the shining wizard, we think about the move. But I always think about the pose he does afterwards. Right, Pro wrestle love, of course. You know, the whole, whole, the whole, the routine, whole, routine, whole like people's elbow, or people's yeah, right, same, right. Uh, you know what? Peep rocks people's elbow came from um, Muto's driving elbow. Really? Yeah. The Rock, Dwayne Johnson himself told Funaki about it. Wow. And I heard directly from Funaki, show Funaki. Yeah, I can see did that. This, yeah. Yeah. Where did this, you know, people's elbow come from? Ro- young Dwayne Johnson, Rock, Rocky, he watched Japanese video and he always regret that it, there was, he wanted to have a tour, regular tour, either New Japan or Old Japan. The time wasn't that. It was Nitro, uh, that the Monday Night Raw and SmackDown era, that there is no really one individual wrestler touring to Japanese company anymore, right? Yeah. He wanted to work either Old Japan or New Japan, just one tour, you know, and he, Rock never did. Wow. But I did see a that, few years uh, ago, he came over and posed with uh, Muto for some pictures. Do you remember that? For I think it was maybe for a movie, like a movie preview. Ah, right. Uh, the Hercules. Movie. Yes, yes. Right, and, uh, right, right. Muto came out wearing kind of like a a bear's yeah, right, head yeah, skin. Right. Oh, that was a costume. That was in movie. I see. Yes. Right. So those two met. Right. But uh, you know, professional wrestler part of Dwayne Johnson always wanted to work Japan. Mm. The time, like, like he was in an era where there was no communications, right? Like WWE never worked with Japanese company, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, there wasn't the time American wrestlers was a touring Japanese company, like Stan Hansen. It was a different so time. He always wanted to tour Japan, but WWE structure, that wasn't the time. And uh, yeah, but that people's elbow did come from Muto's driving elbow. Yeah, I guess it's basically yeah. the same. It just, you stretch it out for a really long time. He added more, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah, it's the same. Isn't that interesting? It's very, very interesting. And yeah. it shows how much, how deep and severe Muto's influence is on pro wrestling. Yeah. And, and it's almost, it's like a wrestling anthropology. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And we need to do part four of KG Muto. You know what? We could be doing podcasts. All, just on KG Muto. To KG Muto. Yeah. I feel like we I might mean, have to pay him a fee after we're finished with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, at least we have to go part four of KG Muto. Part four. So that's the big announcement, I guess, everyone. Part four is coming next time. <laughs> but the, but part four, what we'll do is we'll focus Because on. we got carried away because there's so much there to is. talk about. So much we can share. The more we talk about, the more we know how great he, I mean, influential he was. I mean, he doesn't look, I mean, he's not going to walk around and say, you know, he's a big deal, you know, he is a real person, you know, and very open. And uh, yeah, he doesn't, I mean, he's a superstar though, but doesn't really come off like, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, like uh, never stuck up and you're very, you know, very friendly, you know, and uh, he's honest. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the, the, the most talented, most successful people, at least that I've met in my life, they often have Very open, they huh? have that personality. And the people that don't, that they're they're not at the top, they're maybe in the middle. Those are usually Very insecure. Those are the people that you always have problems with, especially when we talk about talent like uh, wrestling or music or writing. Yeah, yeah, because they're not totally, I mean, like confident, mm -hmm. you know. But that's <laughs> part of what yeah. makes Keiji Muto so great. He's so confident in the ring, especially. Especially as a character like Great Muta, I mean, you need a lot of confidence to pull off something. Like hey, it looks like he's having a great time. It looks like he's know? having fun. I, I don't think any other yeah, wrestlers fun. could do that. Like dancing around, yeah. We went to blow mist and all mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Or just just uh, rolling in and out of the ring, just being kind of a little eccentric. Right, right. It's because and he has that uh, confidence. He, he is the one who's conducting the audience. He doesn't play to the audience mm -hmm. or beg uh, the audience audience are the one who's watching him you know? always always he never asks yeah, instead for... of wrestler playing for the yeah. audience yeah he knows when they'll cheer it's very clear on his face yeah and then he and then what's so amazing he does that very naturally hmm. very naturally and it only could have been from the path that he took his his background i mean he he was wrestling in a, a really special time in america in the south one of like the meccas of pro wrestling in general and he he took some of those crowds and geez, you didn't see that too often where a American crowd would be going wild for a Japanese superstar. And we did see that quite right, a bit. Right. I mean, besides the stereotypical, you know, ethnic, I mean, like a total stereotype Japanese character. Right? I think he really, he was the one who really broke that. I mean, he took the stereotypes, Barrier, but he made yeah. it. I mean, if he didn't do anything, if he didn't add any special uh, flavor to the great Muda character, it could have been just like that. It could have been a, a flop, but I mean, he's the only one who could do that, that great Muta character. A lot of it's, he took it. Yeah, and, yeah. and because he was so individual and so unique, I think a lot of people said, wow, there's so many cool things that wrestlers could do. So what if I did this? What if he did that? What if she did this thing? So I think it opened a lot of people's minds up too. Especially because right, right. he was on TV. He, is, he had the size, you know. And he had the size. Legitimately big, big person. Yeah, he never I mean, looked out Really of big for Japanese. He looked like a great counterpart to someone like Sting. Yeah, Sting, yeah. They were about the yeah. same size, but Sting had the light blonde hair and the right. bright makeup, and he had the darker makeup and dark hair. So, I, And they worked around the horn, too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not the TV, but the house shows every night for about five months period. I'm almost every night. And Muto told Sting, start doing moonsault, you know? And uh, Sting said that I had to practice. <laughs> <laughs> Those two, for being as big as they were, they were Oh, really they respected fly. each other. Respected each other so much. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So then let, let's cut right here. And next time, we'll, we're going to try to yes, finish sir. it. And what I want to focus on, I suppose, we'll focus on Wrestle 1. And we'll yeah. focus on... Which version? First version or second we'll, we'll version? We'll focus on the first version because we only kind of scratched the surface today. But I, I can yeah, also yeah, tell yeah. you about, I was actually at the, uh, the he had his 30th anniversary show in 2014. Okay. I went to that at, at uh, Sumo Hall where he faced Masayuki okay. Kono in the, in the finals. But this was 
Ah, okay, okay, very this good. Was, Those are new wrestlers. Yeah, so know? this was all this was kind of the time where that version of Wrestle One had been working with TNA and it was kind of on the out. It was kind of right. Uh to make a to uh, to make a connection to today's wrestling, Muto's version of all Japan debuted people like Suwama, mm -hmm. you know, Sanada, Kai, uh Bushi? Taichi. Was huh? Bushi there? Bushi there yeah. too, yes, yes, yes. Bushi Hiroshi, uh, Yamato, uh, Suama, uh, yeah. Maybe Kushida too, I believe. Kushida Kendo, was uh, trained by Tajiri. Ah, okay. So he, he was an outsider, but different, uh, different school. A loop. Uh, when Kushida was a little kid, he came to Hustle Wrestling School. Oh my gosh. I'm surprised he's such a good wrestler now. <laughs> so, so talented people, you know, it, it really never mattered, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, but uh, debuting Sanada uh, and Taichi, Suama, you know, Kai, all at the same time. So Muto did develop those new era talent. And he helped train then. them? Yeah. So, yeah, so there's... A, all Japan, uh, Muto's version of All Japan. So that's the in the DNA of modern wrestling, too, is like the, the people he worked with. Right, all, right. Sanada's a big star now. Taichi's a big star now, so... His fingerprints. Swama. Swama is, the, is Mr. All Japan. The crown champion. Yeah. Um, yeah. So his fingerprints are everywhere, actually. Yeah. And, yeah. So it's been 15 years or so. And, and not just Japan. Yeah. In America, in the UK, I think like his influence right. is, is wide reaching. The, the generations of wrestlers who grew up watching, grew up idolizing Muto. Yeah. And he, I believe. And that. I think he was one of the first big <laughs> Japanese TV wrestling stars. At least in North America. I mean, he had TV. He was on TV a lot, and you don't forget a face like that. I mean, that's pretty memorable, especially if you're a child. Right, right. So. Right, right. It's a little different era, too, you know? Because mm. back in 1964, Giant Baba headlined Madison Square Garden against Bruno San Martino, you mm. know? So those were the different eras. So TV, cable TV, satellite, all the technologies, we have to... You know, know all those things. What what was happening in the real world out there to understand Muto? You know, it's a big part yeah. of it. So we'll come back next week and yeah. we'll, we'll talk about Wrestle yes, One. Yeah. We'll talk about how he got involved in pro wrestling, Noah, and we'll get up to today. And yeah, this is going to be his another or oh, maybe final run, but still going strong. Oh my god! And he has a, a yeah. match this month too with Kaito Kimia. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. By the time we finish, I'm sure that match will happen, or it will stay on. Oh, okay, I, I hope okay. we can maybe yeah. finish, and and that'll be the day. I don't I don't remember what day that's on, but that'll be coming up soon. So it's Muto Month here at Fight Game Media yeah, Patreon. Yeah. So well, we yeah, at least we gotta have another uh, part four. Part four. Uh, another episode of yeah. Muto. We'll wrap up. Yeah, I couldn't finish it. Sorry. No, about no, that. no. It's of course. I got carried no, away. No, there's just actually there's so much, <laughs> and we had to talk through. I think the dark ages are really important to talk about, and we'll probably talk about them more. Oh yeah, and the dark age of wrestling. It was I had to go through my own experience. Oh my yeah. gosh, I got a stomach. <laughs> we'll have to someday <laughs> talk about hustle when you're feeling a little better. I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to keel over while we're recording. <laughs> yeah, but oh, and I didn't realize we've been talking this long. That's yeah. okay. It's easy. Well, let's do it again. So we'll yeah. do it soon. We'll come back next week. I'm Justin on Twitter. I'm Justin M. Nipper, uh, at Justin M. Nipper. Fumi on Twitter and uh, Facebook. Can you give us your credentials? Yeah. T on Twitter, Fumihiko Dayo, F-U-M-I-H-I-K-O-D-A-Y-O, Fumihiko Dayo on Twitter. Or you can just find me, Fumi Saito, on Facebook. All right. So I'm going to let Fumi take it away. <laughs> yeah. A so long from Tokyo. And see you next time. Right.